Welcome um, to Making Biometrics or Identity Simple. Uh, my name is Joe Trellin. I'm uh, SVP of Identity Platform and uh, New Verticals at a company called Clear. Um, purpose of this seminar is to, or this panel, is to talk about um, how to create uh, a frictionless identity experience for customers. Uh, as you know, um, if you've tried to set up biometric identities, there's a couple of things you need to worry about. Uh, the first is the expense of creating a repository. The second are the regulatory controls and the, uh, the indemnity or the exposure of, of holding on to those biometrics. And then there's the problem of getting enrollments. Uh, people um, are reluctant to give biometrics uh, and they're reluctant to give them repeatedly. So one of the ways of uh, around, going around that is to create a, bio, a connected biometric system. It makes it very simple. It's a turnkey OEM solution for anyone who wants to use it. And at the same time, uh, customers only have to, or patients or patrons only have to enroll once and they're given a value of a network so that their enrollment can be used repeatedly and everywhere. So uh, we're gonna discuss this concept of a connected uh, biometric identity with our panel. Uh, we'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Pete Solano. I'm uh, Director of Consumer Health for MedStar Health. We're a $5 billion in annual revenue uh, nonprofit, DC, Maryland, Northern Virginia, uh, 10 hospitals and about 400 outpatient locations. Uh, hello, my name is Robert Frederick, CEO and founder of Circle. We are located in Seattle, Washington, and we have, we're, our primary focus is on uh, the intelligence of things. That's our way of uh, describing IoT as opposed to just the Internet of Things, and I'll discuss that a little bit later. And Rob's a little modest. Uh, some of the core in Alexa, Rob was the engineer who built that. Um, Hi, uh, Mike Morris. I'm CIO of Legends. Legends is a third-party services company that serves the sports, entertainment, and attractions market. Um, founded by the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Yankees. Um, we provide food and beverage and merchandising and build some stadiums and everything around the customer experience around sports entertainment. Great. Uh, my name is Brett DeWitt. I'm Director of Public Policy at MasterCard. Uh, actually, recently, pretty new to MasterCard. Started eight months ago. Prior, I was on, worked on Capitol Hill for 12 years. I was staff director of the cybersecurity subcommittee there. Uh, my role in, at MasterCard is kind of overseeing technology policy issues from cybersecurity, privacy, digital identity issues um, going forward. So welcome, glad to be here. Great, thank you guys. So um, I'll, you guys are the show, so uh, why don't we just start off um, with the ways that you're thinking of uh, biometric identity and some of the problems of a simpler connected ID uh, can solve for you. Well, I think you're going to see major disintermediation of the mild part of healthcare uh, from traditional players. Unfortunately, uh, players like MedStar Health, unless we quite wisely pivot to that spot. So, mild in healthcare is a UTI, sinusitis, much of behavioral health, uh, depression, and anxiety, in no way, all of it is mild. It goes mild, moderate, severe. Uh, behavioral health is the number one cost category in American healthcare now. It's 19% of patients we see. And we're all watching a fascinating player that you should check out, Lemonade Health. So LemonadeHealth.com, if you go there or get their app, they're uh, out of San Fran, backed with $11 million recently. There's about 12 ever-growing, maybe 16 now, conditions for which you can fill out a form on the phone or on the web and within two hours, I'm sure coming down to two minutes, possibly two seconds, you'll get a script. Sorry, we say script, prescription, which is probably what you want, right? Uh, the American healthcare uh, industry is very script oriented, as you know. Uh, and a doc doesn't overread, as we understand it. So the computer scores it. Maybe it's AI, right? Everything's AI these days. And then a doc doesn't overread very swiftly think a doc could do a thousand an hour because maybe 997 are green, two yellow, one red, and you get the very thing you want, your script. Now imagine Lemonade under a new brand, of maybe MedStar or Target or Walgreens. I'm sure you get the idea. So that's just classical disintermediation. 
you used to go to a doctor for your sinusitis. You'd schlep there, you'd get your script, you know the story. But <laughs> is that merited, right? There's certain conditions for which you should not be, I'm sure, uh, given a script without a face-to-face -face consultation. But there's every chance a big part of that moves whereby we have non-trivial uh, issues of identity on both sides, right? Who are you and who is the nurse or the doc on the other end, right? Chances are they're working from home. That's the way this model might be most optimal. So I would characterize big healthcare as three big trends these days, and they kind of interrelate. The rise of AI, or as we call it to be more politically correct with docs, AI assist. I just described that, right? The doc does the overread. We're seeing the rise of genetics. Think of the non-trivial issues of identity associated with genetics, right? And potentially your information getting out. And then third and finally, I know in big health care, we're trying to create a firewall against disintermediation that might come. The greatest approach might be to play rather than to fight it. But you can't play unless you can button down the identity on both sides of the transaction. OK, yeah, I'll follow up with that uh, around IoT. Um, and we have discussed a couple of things uh, related to where a connected device uh, needs to actually have identity associated with the person who's interacting with that connected device. There are numerous uh, use cases that involve retail, that involve uh, connected homes, connected buildings, uh, offices. Uh, all these particular uh, use cases involve some form of ID, some form of transaction that is happening between those who have a good or have a service and the person who wants to consume those particular services. So when it comes to uh, identity and biometrics for, uh, for Circle, uh, those particular buildings, those particular services, uh, they exist uh, in vehicles, actually. Uh, a good use case is uh, how many of you have actually used Uber or Lyft? I just want to, yeah. Um, and imagine situations where uh, the actual driver is wondering who that is, who the person is. They're looking at the photo, but they're not really sure, is that the right person? There are use cases where individuals are getting into the vehicle or ordering uh, the actual uh, uh, the ride and then allowing other people to actually take that ride uh, for them. These are identity-related problems that are creating liabilities and concerns for those who are operating those services. Same with uh, stadiums, same with uh, offices, knowing the rights and the rules that are associated with each person, uh, getting access to uh, different uh, uh, parts of an, a building, an airport, is very important. And we are here at Circle uh, creating some of those solutions, some of those capabilities, leveraging biometrics to allow for the, that access control. Uh, within sports, uh, from an access control perspective, there, there, there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, just generally biometrics, I think, uh, provide an incredible opportunity for sports fans and, you know, gosh, we have probably have 50 or 60 use cases of where biometrics, you know, certainly can remove friction from, it, it, we're serving sports clients, we're trying to serve 50,000 people in between innings or quarters as quickly as we can from a commerce perspective, obviously having a known identity and being able to quicken that process and remove the friction associated with transactions and the experience and allow them to enjoy the game is kind of our priority number one. There's lots of use cases as well internally from a staff presence and awareness and identity perspective. So uh, as we go through this, I think that there's just a tremendous number of different use cases ac across this. And this is really the ecosystem of payments, Internet of Things things, you know, identity providers, and you know, this ecosystem, I think, can be applied you know, certainly to sports, but also to, you know, any one of our verticals and businesses. Great. Um, so from a payments perspective, I mean, the view from MasterCard, I mean, we, we see that biometrics um, is key to the future of, uh, of payment services. Um, and this is an area that MasterCard has invested um, a ton of money into uh, and new innovations, new acquisitions. Uh, just give some examples. We have the biometric uh, card that um, breeds your the sensor on a card in order to for authentication purposes. Uh, we have the acquisition of new data, uh, which is a new behavioral biometrics 
um, company that we just acquired in order to bring this um, this technology in house and to offer new services to uh, to our customers. Um, like I said, Mastercard is investing like over the last three years. Mastercard has invested over a billion dollars into cybersecurity, and part of that investment is looking at digital identity issues and where investments need to need to be made. From uh, our perspective, I mean, we see uh, that important to the business on kind of three different areas. One is looking at digital payment flows where identity, interact, and pay is now becoming all important all in one and needs to be done with high assurance. Um, therefore, strong uh, cyber, strong security mechanisms and, and robust privacy protections are going to be critical. Uh, we also look at uh, the use of biometrics and assisting with some of the financial inclusion issues that we have globally, uh, where identity inclusion, um, there's over a billion people in the world today that are not part of the ecosystem, so bringing them into the, the, the global commerce system is going to be critical. And last is looking at the broader ecosystem of digital applications to where the, the user is centric to digital identity. Um, it's going to be critical for global, global interoperability and for people to, to be re reusable and to be able to travel wherever, but with, uh, with high assurance of credentials. So um, this is an area that Mastercard is investing greatly in. Um, and looking at it, it's just there's so many uh, possibilities and where areas where this needs to go. So excited about this uh, this new journey. Thank you, guys. Um, as you think about the things that you're trying to solve in these many different uh, verticals, so we've talked about a bunch, all of which a positive secure identity would create a much richer and more friction-free customer experience. So imagine, uh, in the case of MasterCard, uh, having the actual proof that the person is who they say they are, so that you don't have issues with chargebacks. Uh, being able to do age validation at the same time as you purchase alcohol. In the case of sports, seamless entry, in-seat service, uh, once again, uh, the payments piece, Internet of Things, you have uh, a beautifully connected ecosystem of the computer all around you, but that ecosystem doesn't work unless it knows who you are. So as we start, in, for example, in connected cars, uh, moving the device uh, from your pocket into the dashboard, because there's tablets on the dashboard, that freedom comes from the knowledge of that identity. And in the case of healthcare, uh, not having to find an insurance card, not having to consistently fill out forms, uh, the ability to have integrated medical records uh, just from a single identity is an extremely powerful concept. So uh, the question for you guys is, I think integrating those solutions um, are something that everybody's trying to solve. There are multiple ways of doing it. Um, uh, the connected identity is, is one way. What are ways that, what are the problems you're looking to solve? How might connected identity help you? Uh, with the focus on creating the simplest integration experience and the simplest customer experience. Um, why don't we start with you, Mike? From a customer experience perspective, that's what you know, we're all seeking the connected identity for that. I need you know customers to be able to come in that are already registered and already have a known identity and be able to use that ubiquitously across sports entertainment. I mean, I think that's the panacea that we're looking is a very large volume of identified persons that biometrically you can identify to do all of the things that we're talking about. Frictionless commerce, the ability to identify someone and maybe understand their preferences before. So if you have a high-end premium customer and you come in and you can recognize them and understand their preferences we're able to serve them in better ways uh, that the, you know both the buyer and the seller uh, uh, you know benefit from there there's just uh, you know the, the connectedness and the need need the need to have ubiquity across this in the different use cases I may mean, think that you know we start this process as we are by developing and implementing and piloting individual use cases and as you see the alternate value for another use case this you know hopefully is gonna you know grow and the ecosystem is gonna grow and we're gonna have a nucleus and a mass of a large number of identities which then you know we really can start cooking with gas with respect to you know uses and implementation and integration thanks Mike uh, what are the regulatory concerns of uh, taking people's biometric identities and reusing them, uh, in essence, to create a, a more secure and frictionless world, but we're living in a world that's extremely concerned about privacy and data sharing. Uh, what are some of the ways that we're looking to overcome that? 
How does a connected ID um, deal with that? What are the risks? Um, why don't you take a look at that, Pete? Well, healthcare has always been characterized or mostly been characterized by illiquidity in terms of your records, right? So if you wanted to go from, uh, I'll say this self-servingly, Hopkins to MedStar, you're going to get historically a box of paper, which isn't much use on our side. Now, the great tragedy of that is their EMR, Epic, is not significantly different than our EMR, Cer uh, Cerner. There, I just named the two major EMRs in America. So to me, Joe, the ideal state would be not only knowing that you're you, but also uh, bi-directionality of your record electronically, right? So you'd have on your smartphone uh, or the web, not everybody has a smartphone, the totality of your record in its current state, which would give you a complete ability to go to any healthcare system, or I'm sure as the way things are evolving to a website where you inject that record in real time, the computers crunch away, and then pass you to human beings as needed. If we know you're you and you have complete um, liquidity of your record, uh, we can amplify it over time, right? So it's bi-directional. We're updating it. You're injecting it into a care encounter. That would be uh, powerful. The only thing better, of course, would be tying that to the payer, right? Because we remain principally uh, fee for service or the payment because we collect a copay and increasingly people are going out of pocket. That would be a step changer in healthcare where uh, everything I said was uh, completely aspirational until really the past few months. <coughs> can, I, can I say something Please, on that? Um, so one of the key components of what was just mentioned involves identity of the payer. And the identity of the payer unlocks the information that is associated with the payer. In healthcare, this is extremely important. One of the other aspects that, uh, that people also need to take into account is the, the contract between that actual payer and the healthcare provider and all of the other people who are actually looking at that particular person's information. So it can be the pharmacist, it could be the uh, physician, it could be the person doing x-rays, it could be their mental health uh, provider. So this is one of the things that is really important to us at Circle is knowing exactly who has access what is, the bio, what is the identity of that particular person? What role does that person play? And then what type of uh, information or what segment of uh, the data can they have access to? So it goes beyond just here is a transaction, here's the person uh, initiating the transaction. It goes through the entire value chain for that particular person uh, when they're in the suite um, uh, in the stadium, when they're uh, in a casino, when they're in a vehicle, who are the, all of the different people that are involved? What rights do they have? Can this person use this credit card um, to complete a transaction because he's a trusted uh, member of the family, potentially? Um, or uh, you can get into a situation where the contract between the buyer and the provider only limits them let's say the pharmacist or the, the primary care physician to see only this part of your health care, um, your health history, um, as opposed to all of the other things that they should not have access to. And this is very important and uh, something that biometrics and identity, the connected identity is going to actually bring about. So um, as we look at this new world or a potential new world, what are the problems or the challenges that you're overcoming to do an integration? So for example, in the world that you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, technical integration things that you're expert at as a, at what Circle does, but what are you trying to overcome? The main thing that we're trying to uh, provide is privacy. Um, we're trying to get around fraud uh, so that we can make sure that the person who is asking for the good or the service is actually the one who is paying for it and uh, getting that particular um, value out of the, the system. We are also trying to uh, both centralize as well as decentralize data, uh, just like Pete had mentioned before. It could be on your phone. It could be inside your home. It can be tied to your front door. It can be uh, tied to, uh, again, I'm going to mention the vehicle. By the way, we have a partnership with Mercedes-Benz, but that's a whole other story. 
Um, but that, that wasn't a, that. That was just a disclaimer that there's that no was. conflict of interest. Right. And so the idea basically is, if if you can have this information and you can verify uh, at Circle, we have three components: identity, location, and intent. If you know who the person is, you know where they are at that moment in time, or where they've been then you can understand intent, and that's the AI and the machine learning uh, aspects of um, what we are calling our circle, our ecosystem. So at the core of all of this is the uh, concept or the need to do enrollment, the need to have people willingly give you their biometrics. What are some of the challenges you've seen with that, and what are some of the solutions? Uh, Brett, what do you think? So what we're seeing kind of from a global perspective is where in different countries, the uses are so different. I mean, you have countries like India or Latin America where um, the use of biometrics is more, uh, greater, more socially accepted. Even in India, just for an example, um, you know, MasterCard is participating in the Adahar-based uh, KYC services for banks and other institutions. Um, it's basically an Adahar biometrics is their ways of, of proofing identity in, in India. It's just a use case that has a strong government um, um, involvement in this. Um, similar models um, based on you know, cultural issues are different in the United States. Um, we, we went through that experience with the Real ID Act a couple, um, over a decade ago. Um, so you have to looking at country by country, looking at cultural, looking at where there's, uh, what the policy looks like in, in, in government, what's the governance structure. I know MasterCard, we're actively participating right now uh, within the U.S. on several, entity, uh, several working groups um, to try to, one, create what does the ecosystem look like for digital identity in the United States, looking at what is, a what is the Bill of Rights, um, that digital identity, kind of a Bill of Rights structure of the, 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 the need to build that trust and what does the, the user need to, know, like, it's a sense of confidence and trust of what, of what it is. So there's a lot of work in trying, working with the government, both NIST, the White House staff, uh, to try to figure out what does this ecosystem look like and understand there's many, many partners. But it's an area that MasterCard sees that there's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem, it's bringing, a party, bringing together many different entities, and it's really the policy governance and the, um, the, that, that needs to be kind of worked out. But each country is just so different. But like I said, India is a very unique uh, use case, and given our involvement there, of how we're using biometrics for proofing in, um, in country. If we focus on the U.S. for a second, uh, I'm making the assumption that's probably where a lot of the folks in the room are focused. Um, Mike, how do you convince, you know, you talked about the benefits uh, of reduced friction, easier entry, VIP access, faster payments, alcohol validation, and the list goes on. I know that uh, from our talks outside of this conference uh, that you see a lot of value to it. But I think getting people to participate is uh, a hurdle. How are you thinking about making it compelling and safe for Legends customers to give their biometrics and benefit from them? So security is, is a major constraint. It's frankly, it's a major opportunity. I mean, the reason I'm interested in biometrics is to improve the security posture and the understanding of the identity. With that being said, to really get that ubiquity that I talked about, if I wanted to use biometrics for ticketing, so rather than using a ticket, you use biometrics to come in, you know, it would do a lot of things for our industry. A, uh, sports teams know very few people who are actually fannies in the seats. You know who the ticket buyers are because of the secondary market. I mean, you'd be very surprised how bismal numbers and the knowledge that we have about who's actually in the stadium. It could just do tremendous things for the experience and our ability to serve those customers if we knew who they were, right? So I mean, I think how do you get there? That is a constraint. You know, we would argue on this side that it's more secure, but that's something that's a perception and a customer thing that we're going to have to do over time. I think the way that we're doing it is one, you need an elephant one bite at a time. You, you put out reasonable use cases and build that trust and you have to obviously, you know, go and be proactive with the customer and explain the, the security enhancements, but I mean, it's an evolution and I don't think it's gonna happen overnight. I mean, I think everyone rightfully so, given this environment is gonna have hesitation and I don't see in the very near term my ability to you know, ubiquitously use biometrics because you know, there, there are those concerns. I mean, it's the reality. So it's gonna take some time and some trust. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, the funny thing here is as people and as times move forward, I think the acceptance of biometrics is just becoming greater and greater. 
Um, if you're able to reach into your pockets now or and hold out a whole set of keys and, and sort of dangle them, then you understand the, what it means or the number of badges you have to have to enter buildings, keys, uh, badges. Um, uh, all of these things don't necessarily have to exist in a world where you, uh, there's ubiquity and you're able to have your identity, whether it's your iris, uh, your, your fingerprints, or facial recognition, these particular biometric solutions actually make life easier. And one of the key components of, uh, uh, that we're trying to address ac across numerous verticals here is the idea of ease. And um, to make sure that you don't have to think, you just get service, you just get uh, support, you get engagement, and that engagement is relevant and part of uh, what you're actually looking for, the best experience possible, whether you're in a stadium, whether you're in, a, uh, in an actual hospital, whether you're just trying to complete a transaction, it's all about ease. It's about that ability to focus on what you are there for originally and not have to deal with the hassle of proving who you are, right? That, that's, I think, is the key. And as, as like, my daughter, I, I like to, I'm sorry about uh, a little plug for my daughter here, but I... We I, all like her, <laughs> So one of the key things that sort of just, you know, made a, a light go off for me is my, my daughter goes up to the television screen and tries to change the channel by moving it, <laughs> right? And for me, uh, you know, someone who grew up with the clicker, I don't know if you guys know what I mean, but the remote, that just is completely just strange to actually see that happen, where she just goes up and tries to switch it. Now, at, at this point, she's hitting a button and using her voice to actually change the stations. That paradigm shift is happening. It's going to continue to occur. And as more and more people become used to the idea of these things reacting to them and sort of physically enabling them to get what they want without too much trouble. I believe that the biometric uh, signups, uh, people who are into uh, services like Clear, will continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, and we're going to see a, a complete shift in this idea of this is my information, I'm scared of uh, my identity being uh, you know, misused as more and more people uh, are basically getting value out of the system, the ecosystem of connected devices, connected buildings, connected services. And uh, I think from the MasterCard point of view, I, I believe people were terrified of doing uh, transactions online. And uh, look where we are today. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Brett, because we didn't talk about this in advance, but uh, MasterCard actually did a, a study with Oxford University on uh, biometric adoption. And uh, they asked people, given the choice between username and password for identity and biometrics for identity, 93% said they would prefer biometrics. And it's an indication of how things were changing. And I'll, uh, I'll share a story about credit card adoption that, that Rob mentioned. Uh, so I was at Amazon in 2005, and I was responsible for their music category. And one of the things we knew was that the, the, heads of the, fi the financial heads of the household were moms. And moms had yet to want to put credit cards on the internet. And at that time, Amazon actually determined that they would create the mom store to give them value to put the credit cards on the internet. So I think it boils down to uh, a value proposition that we potentially might change uh, the way people are thinking about things. So thank you for reminding me of that, Rob. So um, there are two types of biometrics uh, right now. There's the federated biometrics, you work with both, Rob, where your device holds your biometric, and then there's a centralized or connected biometric. 
Where do you see the industry going with both? Will they live in combination? Uh, do you see values that each one of them brings? Um, any one of you uh, who are interested in answering? Well, uh, just really fast. Uh, I believe that there's always going to be a blend of the two. I, I think that I mentioned before the smart contracts. Um, I know there's a, a lot of buzz going on with the, the term the blockchain and things like that. Uh, for me, in the IoT world, and when I change the name from Internet of Things to Intelligence of Things, you have to actually have intelligence at the device level in order for the, the use cases that we're discussing to actually work. So there's going to be different levels of interaction, uh, support, um, and compute uh, that will happen device to device at the edge as well as uh, device, device to device to device uh, to the center. <coughs> and uh, that's, that's what we're doing at Circle. We're trying to figure out what, what percent of the, the transaction and the use cases are going to happen away from the centralized system, what is appropriate for that to occur, and then to bring it back to a centralized system so that that end customer can actually uh, benefit from it wherever they go. So uh, a combination in healthcare of the federated identity and the centralized identity is coming from this new Apple product, which I know, uh, Pete was a little modest. Uh, he was actually involved in the Apple uh, healthcare uh, pilot. Can you talk to us a little bit how you're thinking about the differences in identity, the way those records are integrated, and how you might move going forward? really trying to get to a description that's different than what I said at the top. I said MedStar's 10 hospitals, 400 outpatient locations, and then I had to pause. But with the right approach to identity, we could be in 2 million homes. Right? How much of your care could we pivot to the home if we knew who you were and you had your record in this bi-directional format? So as Joe mentioned, on January 24th, 18, Apple, with their uh, health team, announced that that uh, health app on your iPhone that you can't get rid of uh, can now hold your record. So uh, MedStar, along with 11 other systems, was part of that launch. I'm sure it'll go wide soon enough. Right now, it's still in beta. But it's unidirectional, right? So you can go, in our case, from Cerner out to your phone. You can have the records of other providers as well. Bring that with you to the doctor. Imagine a day when it's bidirectional. You can inject it into a web platform. I think a key issue for us is getting away from clipboards. It's embarrassing as a consumer-centric business that we constantly say, who are you again? Hand your clipboard, you scribble for five or seven minutes, then we laboriously retype your bad handwriting for three to five minutes. That's longer than your appointment with the doctor. Uh, so if for no other reason, then we're a big fixed capacity system, right? Like an airline or a hotel, we have seats, we have rooms, we have slots on doc schedules. To the extent that your record could simply be injected when we know you're you, rather than re-scribbled yet again, we could have far more slots available, right? Uh, you'd get swifter care, you're sick after all. So without regard, Joe, to how uh, the rigging happens, I know the key benefit for the consumer is uh, that high convenience, low friction that other industries, uh, airlines and hotels specifically seem to be so far out in front of healthcare. We need to become more like them. Um, how important is it to uh, any of you here, uh, the level of personalized identity or secure identity that uh, direct biometric brings compared to an abstracted biometric on a federated device? Please. Um, the federated, uh, what is actually out on the edge, uh, again, this is the federated um, versus, uh, you know, uh, one centralized system. What we're basically seeing is when we're talking to our customers uh, and we're, their customers uh, as well, when, when there's analysis being done, people want their information readily available, but they also want to have different levels of that information available to the, the devices and the, to the people who are that they're interacting with. That idea of having multiple layers, 
multiple levels of identity, meaning let this device or this uh, service provider know that I'm a male, um, uh, my age range, and where I'm from, and that's it, versus actually uh, going to a hospital and then having all of my information available for this one department. So, or going across multiple departments so that uh, if I have some sort of uh, conflict in my medication, I don't actually get uh, sick or uh, have problems. There are, there is a massive need and a massive push by end users to say that they want different levels of identity. They don't want everything to be available to anyone they want it to only be available to the right person at the right time in the right uh, situations. Thanks. Um, from MasterCard's perspective, Brett, um, where does it see, I know you, you had mentioned it's investing hundreds of millions of dollars into these technologies. Uh, and I'll ask all of you the same question. What's your future view? What does the world look like in five to 10 years? Like I said, I mean, we feel, and it's market by market, um, and the question, the answer to the question is going to be is very different. But we also see that it's going to be a global interoperable network that needs to needs to bring a lot of this together uh, for specific use cases that are identified. Um, looking at the security investments from a MasterCard perspective, um, I mean, some of the things related to biometrics that we see is just ensuring the liveliness of detection techniques um, are being used, uh, the protection of the match templates. Um, as well as just the appropriate local versus uh, central implementation. Um, those are just some, you know, some key areas, but the five year looking ahead, from our perspective, is about trust with the user. That is what's going to build the, um, the, the ecosystem around this. Um, that's where, from our perspective, having it transparent and open, this is what we're gonna use with your data. This is, um, it's right to own, right to be forgotten. Um, some of the elements the, that are coming out of GDPR that's going on in Europe right now, a lot of those strong privacy protections that give control to the user, um, that assurance is, is critical to building this ecosystem up. And uh, we think that that's a, that's a place where to start. Mike, where do you see the world going? Well, uh, assuming the continued evolution of the security and the trust between uh, you know, biometrics and the end customer, and also assuming current evolution of the passivity of the technology, I think sky's the limit. And I think if you're gonna fast forward 10 years, hopefully via facial or some passive biometric uh, marker uh, could truly, I mean, I think that I said in the beginning that, that biometrics has the largest chance to have the broadest impact on sports, entertainment um, fan experience of anything, right? And so that could be your ticket, that could be your payment, that could be your wayfinding individually. Like really the entire experience could be transformed if we can get to a passive biometric, you know. We are, you know, less secure, need to be, need to be less secure than a medical environment. So I think that sky's the limit in the ways that we can use it for the right ways to really enhance the experience in, in venue. So, it's it's kind of funny for me because uh, this exact question I was asked almost 23 years ago. Uh, so when it comes down I, to... I think I asked. <laughs> so the idea here is, uh, besides the fact that I've known Joe for a long time, um, the, the key here is a connected world is, again, about ease. It's, it's exactly what uh, was mentioned earlier from the payment side all the way down to understanding who the person is, everything that you can do in a passive way, uh, to steal that word from Mike, um, this, is, this is what commerce is going to be about. This is about not having to pull out things from your pocket to prove who you are. This is about um, the intelligence of the devices and your surroundings to know exactly who you are and then provide a value to you without you having to actually think about it. That is that is what we are moving towards. Um, I'm going to jump out of commerce for a second and also talk about um, uh, the various crises, crises I guess that are happening worldwide. When you get into the biometric sort of aspect of this, of going through immigration, uh, traveling between countries, having uh, your, med your medical records, your uh, birth certificate, your citizenship, uh, all basically tied to a, a, a centralized global system uh, so that you can very quickly and easily be identified. 
um, at the border, um, when you're voting, uh, those particular things uh, where, you know, right now it, things are in question. It's, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's in the news a lot, <laughs> as you can imagine. But the idea ultimately is, it's not just about commerce, it's about making it easy and uh, just friction free to actually establish who you are and have your records available with you anytime, anywhere. Um, that is where I, th I see uh, this actually moving. Pete? I'll go three years out down to one year out. Three years out, everybody here will have their genetic fingerprint in their health record, whole genome or whole exome. You should know there's 20,000 genes. To give you an idea of how imminent that is, if you have cancer, you're gonna get a 592 gene assay that fraction of the 20,000. That's moving very rapidly. Uh, you should know 23andMe and Ancestry.com together get about 55 million monthly visits to their websites. You know, there's only 240 million American adults, so think about that for a minute. Two years out, uh, the healthcare landscape will have radically changed. Amazon, CVS, Aetna, Apple, Target, Walgreens, CVS, uh, big players uh, consolidating healthcare systems of the type of MedStar. I imagine security, uh, privacy will be a major aspect of competitive advantage. And then one year out, if you're late to a meeting at work and you say, ah, sorry I'm late, I had to go to the doctor, I, I have sinusitis, I wanted to get a script, people will fall off their chairs with gales of laughter. So the mild business is gonna become that uh, different versus uh, the way it is today. Thanks, Pete. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, really, uh, it falls on two things, scalability and least common denominator. Uh, I would suggest that uh, we still have the paper records, we still have the paper tickets, we still have swipe cards because they work every time, no matter what. What, and every time we raise that bar, the, some of those one billion plus users that are not in the game keep falling off. What are the business decisions or the business criteria that you see as being necessary to meet to continually raise that lowest end of the spectrum so that we can get to some of these wonderful things that you're talking about? Yeah, it's an evolution. I'm just going to use the case of digital ticketing in sports, and there's a good parallel. You know, years for, we've in sports struggled not knowing the identity of the people sitting actually in the seats because of the secondary market for years and years and years. So, you know, years ago, we, we thought the killer app was going to be digital ticketing, force everyone to go to digital ticketing to have th this awareness. And uh, so that happened has helped significantly that does not completely solve the problem and you need to take it to the next level but there are a lot of lot of uh, sports properties that are falling in a line saying I'm only going digital ticketing I think in four years you will see that we still send commemorate tickets out that you can you know have it as a souvenir but um, that's just the evolution you'll see that so I think that biometrics will be the same story over time we have to start drawing the line in the sand and bringing up that least common denominator it's a good point and I think that the impetus is on everyone the buyer and the seller and society to keep pushing you know that forward I can give you an interesting parallel uh, in my opinion it has to do with customer value proposition the more worth there is to the customer the more adoption there will be I think easy pass is a really good example uh, when it first started it was one lane and uh, you know everyone was going to the toll booths now it's almost all the lanes and people are paying very few people are paying manually and the reason is, is people cared about their time and they cared about the value proposition. I see it as an iterative thing, as there's more and more value that, uh, and convenience that a biometric ID will give you, the more and more people will adopt it, like credit cards online or cell phones or easy pass. At least that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Oh, Rob, did you want to? I was just gonna say really fast, uh, when it comes to the technology itself, uh, you have to actually make sure that things work without um, uh, an action. You have to actually push some of the intelligence to the edge. Let's just put it that way. And if everything is required uh, to have a centralized system to work, then what you end up with is a situation where you at least need to have that centralized system federated as well, not just one single particular central source. Yes, sir.
Hi, I'm Steve Wilson from Constellation Research. My, my question is that I don't think anybody on the panel is talking about proportionality in collection. Um, the, the idea of centralised, you know, you call it direct biometrics to me, is such a, a way of indexing everybody and over-collecting. I mean, maybe you misspoke when you said that biometrics would be used to identify people when they vote. I mean, that's just bizarre. Um, so I wonder if anybody's got a sense of um, whether or not there is a downside to this and whether we're indexing everybody from a single unique the, the genome. I mean, sure, millions of people are hitting on 23andMe, but last year it, millions of people were hitting on Facebook. It's not a popularity contest. The privacy problems of Facebook may see them go backwards, but I don't see any sensitivity amongst the panel to, this, to the privacy and collection problem. I think that's a, I think that's a, a very uh, good question. I would say that uh, perhaps we didn't mention it because the sensitivity of privacy is something we take for granted and the need for uh, either a federated or, or a connected identity. Um, the truth is, is that the consumer or the customer will drive this through convenience and they will choose those sources that they trust. They're less likely to give their information to the government and they're more likely to give their information to places that can prove their privacy. Um, I think that uh, it's a lesson, it's a life lesson for Facebook to pay fast and loose with people's privacy. Equifax the same and I would dare to say Google the same. So I, I think for those companies who are looking to um, help customers make a more secure and uh, easier world, their livelihood is dependent upon that level of propriety to the data. Um, the truth is, is that um, a biometric identity uh, regarding biographic data is no more risky than the data that Equifax had, and I think it's another conversation to say that it's less risky. At the core of it is the financial risk that one takes by playing fast and loose with the propriety of the data from an economic sense and from a regulatory sense, the same thing. Any other questions? Anything else? Hi, um, I'm Ren from Upwork. I have a question for the panel, which is, um, have you guys encountered situations where organized fraud ring trying to game the biometric uh, verification? And what is the methodology you guys use to detect or treat such fraud? Uh, sure. Um, there are uh, basically two areas of fraud. The first is garbage in, garbage out which is I want my biometrics associated with somebody else. Um, for that, uh, stringent identity processes, sometimes with humans involved, uh, that ensure that level of marriage between the person and the biometrics is incredibly important. Things like uh, knowledge-based quizzes, uh, physical facial identification, artificial intelligence to do internet quizzes with two or three levels of uh, concurrence so that you can do like a Bayesian analysis. If somebody wants to, ch uh, to fake a social media, the odds and the cost of, of faking two to three concentric circles of social media are almost impossible to break. So the levels of uh, propriety necessary in the initial identity are extremely important and I think those companies that take that seriously and have the IP um, will, be, will be the winners in the space. And I think you could also say that FinTech is making some pretty good strides there. People don't mind giving their biometrics for their financial information. I think the second thing that you need to be concerned with is liveness. So um, once you know that the person is the person in the biometric repository, be it um, federated or, or connected, um, then it's, can I get a hold of your biometric, which in the case of a face is pretty easy to get a hold of. And if I can, is there liveness detection? Is the technology uh, secure enough to determine that liveness? And I can tell you that all of the modality vendors from face to finger to iris, even to voice, uh, they know that if in order to do that is their livelihood. So you're correct. Um, 
that is a risk. Um, I think that uh, it's a risk that's being addressed. And I think that the other thing is, particularly on the liveness risk, it's less important if you're looking to get into a stadium, no offense, and it's more important if you're looking to get into a hospital. So I think that the level of, of investment that people make will be proportionate to where the biometric is being used. Any, any other questions? By the way, thank you for, for, that, you know, for being Phil Donahue. That's very nice of you. So uh, following the recent incidents with Equifax and Facebook, I think it's safe to say uh, trust in big companies and government is at the lower levels of history. Uh, from a both like customer engagement standpoint and a regulatory standpoint, do you expect that to have any uh, slowing impacts on the creation of a centralized biometrics database? I would say the answer lies in benefit to the customer. Ultimately, it's the customer that's going to decide whether they want to use biometrics and the means of trust. So um, if you ask about the rate of adoption, which is I think what you're asking about, it remains to be seen whether or not companies that are looking to do, it doesn't have to be centralized either, it can be federated. But countries are looking to make lives different or easier, more secure with biometrics, will be dependent upon the trust customers put in them. So the adoption will have to do with the value proposition, and uh, then secondarily, um, the compelling case they can make for the propriety of the data. And I think EULAs go a long way for that. I think uh, uh, opt-ins, things of that nature. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we'll make this the last question. Pete, did you have anything to add to that, or from a regular perspective, Brett? Yeah, I mean, I would say I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but this is from a MasterCard perspective. We believe that there should be a some digital identity bill of rights that lays out very, very clearly that's transparent and open about you know when you sign up for this, what what's going to be your, what um, the use of your data, um, what can be done with it, your control. You have the right to decide as a user when it's going to be used, what's part of that. Um, but it's really, I mean, the trust is, is, is the critical element here, and that's why we think this form of Bill of Rights, which is I know the, across the industry sectors are trying to come up with this, coming together about how can we provide an ecosystem that all adheres to a sense of transparency and strong pri privacy protections. And just, just like what was just stated, that Bill of Rights, that uh, control, that capability, um, needs to be in the end user's control. And it's extremely important for that to occur. And some of the things that uh, are being addressed and uh, w that we're looking into right now, uh, from a technology point of view, uh, when there is the level of adoption uh, needed for these smart contracts, for uh, understanding exactly what is going to be done and who can actually get access to this data, when that is adopted by more and more platforms, you will get exactly that, that Bill of Rights, that, that assurance that the information that you are storing will only be seen by the person and people and the organizations and the companies that you want uh, to be able to see that information. So it's about rights, it's about rules, it's about contracts, it's about uh, digital contracts, not physical, like paper contracts, but we're talking about things that are being uh, computed, uh, analysis is being done in a matter of milliseconds to determine who has the rights to the information, and that addresses fraud as well. Um, one of the key components that wasn't mentioned, I don't know why, um, but uh, when you're using something like clear, there's also the human element associated with that. So when you're walking through and you're putting your, you're using biometrics, there's usually someone validating that you are physically that person by looking at you. When you walk into an Amazon Go store, which is uh, using presence, they're looking to see if you match that particular profile. So it's not always going to be digital, but there's gonna be some level of verification. Any, one more question, if you'd like, and, and uh, last question, sure. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I think I'm going to piggyback on what you said, Brad. You said Rob. That the data belongs to the owner, yep. and if we forget that, nobody will be on the stage. I think we I all agree with that. And, and yeah. I think a lot of companies that have fallen, including government OPM, they forget that. Like, I could not go right now and delete my data out of that. That's, right. that's yes. correct. That's why. I just stopped my service. That's exactly right. And I think that's where a lot of people get caught up. And if you ever want to do business with EU, we're not. Oh. You're correct. All right. Well, I want to thank you all very much for. Um, for listening, and um, if you have any questions, uh, please contact us. Thank you.